Well, I've got a little after eight. I'm going to go ahead and, and get going. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Um, my name is Karen Plasinski, and I'm with Project Dragonfly. I've, I've uh, been with Dragonfly now um, five years full time and, and uh, for a couple of years before that as part timer. Uh, but my background is zoology and wildlife uh, ecology. Um, I taught actually at the undergraduate level coursework pride predominantly in field zoology, uh, general ecology, uh, wildlife biology, those types of courses until about 2016 when I uh, found out about dragonfly and it was kind of serendipitous, um, but I just teach had just been teaching online and found out about this large degree program for people who are passionate about uh, conservation and nature that uh, literally was just a couple states away. And I'm like, where have you been my whole life? But um, after that, I uh, got familiar with the program and, and have been with Dragonfly since uh, 2016. And it's been great. Um, and I've got a co-presenter, Katie, you would go ahead and introduce yourself. That'd be great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Kaur. I am from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I am a, I work in the conservation education department at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. I am a graduate of the Global Field Program. Um, um, I did an MA at that time. It was in zoology. So my MA is in zoology. And uh, I run the Cleveland um, Program Association with the AIP. So I coordinate all of the Web Plus, all the Web Plus classes and serve as the advisor for all the Cleveland Associated AIP students. Um, so I do a lot of work in obviously adult educational programming, uh, community engagement and conservation uh, through my work with the zoo. So I'm really excited to be here tonight and to share a little bit of my experience and a little bit of information with you all as you kind of consider um, what your futures might look like. Yeah, Katie's a, a perfect um, co-presenter as she's got a lot of experience leading our AIP program at Cleveland Metro Parks. And you've also been involved in the Earth Expeditions courses as well as a graduate and actually leading those courses too. And I'm sure she'll be able to tell us a little bit about that. But um, first and foremost, we are, let me uh, advance the slide. What uh, let me talk about the format. We're, we're supposed to keep it to half an hour. It's going to be difficult, but uh, we'll try to do our best to do that as we know you all have busy lives. But we're planning on about half an hour of going through some slides and presenting some background information about the degree, uh, about the requirements, some tips for getting in, uh, and other information that you're likely eager to find out. Um, there's a lot of information on our web pages, but um, quite a bit. Uh, so, and we don't expect that you will have digested all of that. And we um, would also love to field your questions. So if you have a Q&A at any time, feel free to drop it in the chat. One of the things that Katie's gonna be doing is, is helping me keep an eye and sift through those questions. Uh, or you can put it down at the Q&A at the bottom and we'll try to get to those. And then after about half an hour, we will um, kind of take a quick break and uh, let people leave if they need to. And then whoever else has uh, questions is welcome to stay on the call and uh, Katie and I will do our best to answer those. So that's what the format is gonna be. And so let me advance a slide here if I can. Okay. Um, so welcome. We're, we're glad you're here. Um, whoops, let me back up. Sorry, I jumped a slide there. Um, let's back up and talk about uh, uh, Project Dragonfly. Uh, we are a degree, master's degree program that uh, focuses on conservation, and we're actually um, out of Miami University, and that's in Ohio, not Florida. Um, Miami University is a large public institution in Oxford, Ohio. Um, of course, we're fully accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Um, and Project Dragonfly um, is um, housed under the Department of Biology. We're actually part of the Department of Biology, although we really are, are uh, quite large for a graduate program. And currently we have almost a thousand students. And so we really overwhelm even some of the 
the undergraduate um, departments at um, Miami University. Uh, our graduate programs are predominantly online. I'm sure you've gleaned if you've um, read anything on our web pages. Uh, part of the advantage is that uh, we're asynchronous and we the program was developed for working professionals. So the majority of our students are out there um, working and have families, in many cases, busy lives. Um, we uh, do attract students from all different backgrounds. So we do have, I would say, a fair number of students from traditional science backgrounds, but really the only prerequisite, um, and it isn't really a prerequisite, but the common thread that um, all of our students share is a passion for the natural world and conservation and, and uh, a sincere interest in wanting to do um, something for your local community and uh, actually uh, help me out, Katie, um, perform ecological and social change. Sorry, I'm getting a little tongue tied here. Um, but anyway, make a change in your community for the better. And so, yeah, so several of our, or many of our students have backgrounds that are traditionally in biology, but really we attract people from all walks of life and all ages too. We're quite diverse, um, more diverse than you might expect. We have students that are kind of looking at the degree as a stepping stone to perhaps another making a career uh, shift um, because they've always you know, had a passion for the natural world, but just somehow got into another kind of life tracked. Um, we have people who are uh, professional educators. Um, we were actually originally devised, not devised, but um, a large population of our students were initially teachers. Um, Project Dragonfly has a, as far as offering master's degrees, we've been offering master's degrees for well over a decade. Um, but Project Dragonfly actually, let me back up and kind of talk about the origins because we started as a children's magazine that actually elevated children's inquiry to the level of uh, professional scientists and published it in a national publication, kind of like a Ranger's Rick. And that then spun off, we had several kind of um, uh, side branches, if you will, of, of using the evolution uh, parallel. Um, over the years, we had a uh, very successful Saturday morning children's television show that again, featured um, children's inquiry and um, took it seriously and, and, and demonstrated this to um, folks that A, everyone can do science, um, and everyone should take an interest, obviously, in science. Everyone has a voice, and we want to elevate people's voices uh, to have a say in basically the future of the planet, um, particularly underserved communities, I would say, um, we've, we've focused on. Um, and so uh, going back to our student population, we attract students from traditional who are you know, professional teachers in the classroom to informal science educators. These would be people like Katie who are doing science education at zoos, botanical gardens, uh, nature centers, natural history museums. Um, and then we also um, attract people, um, let's see, what other populations would you say, Katie? We attract, uh, as I say, all ages from students coming right out of undergraduate school to retirees that are kind of looking to retool in retirement and perhaps give something back uh, to their community, volunteer at a local nature center or a zoo. What am I missing, Katie? Uh, I think I think there's actually a little bit of, of everything, which is one of the most exciting parts uh, for me as a student and then also for me as a as an instructor and a facilitator um, is that I can't think of a a particular sort of professional field that we have not had represented by a student. 
um, over, over my years of involvement with the program. And that's largely because this is how conservation actually happens, right? It doesn't happen when just biologists get together or just educators get together. It happens when biologists and educators and marketers and community organizers and, you know, and, and everybody in between, people in big business, people in small business, it's when they all get together and, and start to focus on these changes and move things forward that real sustainable and systemic change actually happens. So I feel like that's one of the most energizing parts of this program is that everything is represented as it should be. Um, and we learn so much by hearing from these really diverse voices. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, we have people from the business world or marketing or communications, and you would think, well, why are they pursuing, you know, perhaps a master's in biology? But um, when you think about conservation, you think about, um, you know, reaching people that that uh, involves uh, communication skills, it involves creativity. And so um, even people from our artists, you know, we've had people uh, combine their interest in either uh, theater or, you know, uh, traditional painting or even dance with, with conservation and come up with some, some really creative approaches to engage their uh, communities. Uh, well, I think we've um, had several of you go ahead and drop your names and locations in the chat, but if you hadn't yet, um, we welcome you to do so. And we'll try to, and, and, and also your questions too. How can I participate or help as a student? Uh, is a question. We'll come back to that. Uh, we've got San Diego, we've got Savannah, Georgia. We're so glad you're here. Uh, and, and Katie, will you keep an eye on the chat there so we don't miss any of the questions? Detroit, San Francisco. Um, let's talk a little bit about Project Dragonfly's mission. Uh, now the mission again is to build an alliance of individuals uh, with the content knowledge, uh, we are one of our core tenants is inquiry. The other two are community and voice. And so we promote inquiry driv driven education uh, for the benefit of uh, ecological communities and, and society, basically. Um, and uh, again, we uh, have been around the children's magazine actually um, started uh, just over 25 years ago. So we just celebrated our, our 25 year anniversary a couple of years ago. And the idea with starting uh, with Dragonfly and people ask why Dragonfly? Um, well, it, it's a very cool insect and it also go, undergoes a metamorphosis like many of our students do because um, one of the words that you frequently see when you talk to our graduates is that this program is transformational and, and uh, a dragonfly and, and many insects actually go through quite a transformation as they go through their life cycle. Um, a dragonflies too are, are individuals that you can find in little patches of wetlands and many of our learning sites, we'll talk about the two sister programs here in a few minutes, but many of our partner zoos and botanical gardens are located in urban or suburban areas. And the two images that you have on the slide here with Beyond the Classroom, the uh, founders of Project Dragonfly, Chris and Lynn Myers, you may have come across their name, but they were real visionaries. And their idea was that education should extend beyond the, the boundaries of the four walls in a classroom. And a classroom has certain constraints. And just when you say that room, classroom, what do you traditionally think of? You think of a person up in front lecturing, you know, kind of a one-way communication of information. Whereas um, one of the core tenets of Dragonfly is that um, the students and the instructors kind of share a collective responsibility for the education. As Katie was mentioning, we have people from all different backgrounds, uh, you know, from the business world, from communications, and um, our Dragonfly's perspective is that everyone has a valid voice and that um, the sum of the parts is really greater, um, you know, than the whole that, um, you know, 20 people together, the, the collective energy and information that is shared in these learning communities is, is truly 
uh, amazing. And um, we'll talk about some of that. And Katie, anything you want to add? Let's let's talk. Let's kind of go back in your life because um, we're going to talk about applying to the program. And obviously, everyone who's here tonight found out some some way about Dragonfly. How did you find about the uh, out about the program? Because that was kind of back in the earlier days. And and what attracted you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... I started in the Global Field Program in 2010, which was just its second year of, of existence. So I was in the second group of cohorts. Um, and I found out about it because kind of there's sort of like a, a twofold piece. So sort of, Karen, you mentioned this sort of serendipitous moment that led you to Dragonfly. And I kind of had that same moment. Um, I had worked at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo for several years, um, running some different educational programs, but was interested in growing my own professional skill set, as well as making myself more marketable to move up or to take on different responsibilities at the zoo. Um, so I had started inquiring with my boss about pursuing um, graduate studies and if there was any type of um, employer reimbursement program um, at our organization and, and what that might look like. And she was sort of very, uh, very strange about it all and was very uh, just hold that thought for a little while. Um, and I didn't know that at that point, our director of education had already been in conversations with Project Dragonfly about potentially becoming a, a master institution site. Um, and that they had sort of tagged me in their minds as the person that would, would be a good fit to run that program. Um, so after a couple of weeks, she came back to me and explained why she was a bit kind of a mysterious in her response and said, uh, we would like to start the AIP at Cleveland um, and we would like you to head up that program. But the catch is in order for you to head up that program, we want you to get your master's. Um, and ideally we'd like you to get your master's through an existing Project Dragonfly graduate program. Cause at that point, AIP didn't yet exist. It was just still in the works. Um, and so they said, if you can do, if you're up for doing the global field program, um, that would be, that would be fantastic. And I sort of like did a double take, I was like, if I'm up for it, like, not only did I already ask you about pursuing my graduate studies, like this is the most unique and interesting sounding program I've ever heard in my life. And you want me to do it for work? Sign me up. Yes, please. I'm pretty sure I was already like buying notebooks and packing my bags before I even finished my application. So um, yeah, the timing was perfect. Um, so I kind of found out about it through an internal way. Um, but still to this day, the majority of our students at Cleveland um, hear about it from somebody that's in the program or somebody that knew somebody in the program. So lots of word of mouth. So I think even if it hadn't come to me in that sort of like professional context, it was all a matter of time before I heard about it from somebody in the area. Cool. Cool, thanks for sharing. Uh, well, before we leave the slide, so we've talked a little bit about some of the constraints of classroom education, um, but uh, on the right, it, that's actually a picture from one of our Belize EEs. I, those were actually some students on one of the EEs that I led, I don't know, four or five years ago, it was before the pandemic, but um, it, it kind of gives you uh, just kind of a, a flavor of, of the trip and the excitement and um, of being in the field. Uh, it really is, um, you know, to be with 20 like-minded people in one of these incredible global uh, sites that that we travel to on in in on the EEs, which are part of the GFP, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Here, it, it's really an amazing experience. Um, so uh, let's continue to talk a little bit more about Project Dragonfly. Um, so let's talk about the. There's two main branches to the program, and these are um, sister programs, if you will. We've got the GFP or the Global Field Program, which you can see on the left there, and and both of the master's degrees are are 35 credit hours. And then we have the Advanced Inquiry Program or AIP uh, that's on the right that Katie and I are or more affiliated with. But but there's a lot of overlap with the program because you can see in the middle um, there are 14 credit hours. We have five quote unquote core classes that every student takes. And these are delivered through 100% online delivery, uh, predominantly asynchronous, which means that, that that allows you to work, you know, kind of at your own pace and fit it in among your work schedule, your, your life schedule, your family schedule, and all the other important responsibilities that you have. 
Um, you occasionally may have some options for face-to-face -face Zooms or something like that, but, but it's always, um, we keep that flexibility in mind and, and all of our instructors do when, when they're working um, in these courses with, with you students. And then you can see um, on the sides of the slide, uh, the difference between the GFP and the AIP is uh, the location of the um, experiential learning that takes place, not just the location, there's kind of a, a, a different emphasis that we'll talk about that, but the, the global field program as the name implies has an international emphasis. So a GFP student over the course of um, their time in the degree um, will take three uh, Earth Expeditions courses. Uh, now these are seven credits total um, and the, the travel part of uh, the course actually occurs in the summer with a five credit class. And then you follow that up with a two credit, what's called inquiry and action course um, in the fall. And currently we go to, I think it's 15 or 16 different uh, sites globally. We'll take a, a quick look at those. These are biodiversity hotspots and we have some of the top um, leaders in various conservation pro projects in each country that partner with us. So you get to rub shoulders with, again, some of these uh, actually globally world renowned um, folks that are doing amazing things with conservation in their own country. And then kind of the idea is you glean that inspiration and then you bring it back um, home and uh, do uh, some sort of amazing uh, master plan because all the students create their own self-driven master plan in your community. And, and again, community is broadly defined. That could be um, you know, if you are working in a zoo and you're a keeper in, in some specific tax of animal, it might be all the keepers of, you know, marsupials in, in North America or something like that. Um, so community is, is, again, very broadly defined. Um, and then let's uh, talk a little bit about the AIP. Um, again, you take the same 14 core credit hours that everyone takes. So you will be in coursework in your core classes with students uh, who are in uh, both the AIP and GFP. Um, some of those students may be the same in various core classes, but there's a lot of turnover so, so that you get exposed to a, a wide variety of people from different backgrounds. Um, but the 21 credits in the Advanced Student Quarry Program, those are the courses that take place with the experiential learning at the zoo and or botanical garden. And we currently have 10 partners. We just added a 10th in the Detroit Zoo. And as Katie told you, uh, she heads up the program at Cleveland Metro Parks. Um, either program can lead to an MA or an MAT. Um, the MAT, just to clarify, because sometimes we get some confusion about that. Um, this is for uh, teachers who already have licensure in their particular state. Our degree does not confer licensure. Uh, and and um, the, the, the coursework is the same, but, but what would differ between the MA and the MAT would be uh, predominantly the emphasis in your master plan. The MAT students would be uh, likely working with your own students in the classroom, and your research would be more towards uh, classroom learning, uh, pedagogy, uh, versus the MA is, is kind of more open-ended. Um, you can switch degrees um, midstream. That sometimes happens that someone starts with the MAT and then realizes they really want to pursue an MA or vice versa. And your advisors, uh, your facilitators like Katie at uh, Cleveland Metro Parks can chat with you about that. But both programs are 35 degrees in total. And again, there's a lot of very, uh, very much a lot of flexibility with the program. Um, you can complete it in as quickly as two and a half years, or you can stretch it out if you want to uh, take things more slowly to uh, five years. And it really just depends on, you know, your particular life. Um, most students are going to have some major life event, perhaps like getting married or, you know, moving or something like that over the course of that time. And, and you may elect to sit out a semester. That's 
that's uh, fine too. All of that flexibility is built into the program. Um, let's see, Katie, since you uh, design really and, and, and um, work with the students on the experiential learning, can you tell us a little bit uh, kind of a, what the diversity of experience, well, you can't encapsulate it, I know, in just a couple of minutes, but what's so special about the face-to-face -face learning at Cleveland Metro Parks or, or any of our other partner sites? Yeah, um, those experiential uh, learning opportunities really put this, this incredibly unique and for lack of a better word, incredibly special um, spin on each on each of these courses. Don't get me wrong, the web core courses are also fantastic. Um, but those experiential courses with that face to face time really creates a sense of community that's hard to replicate in a strictly online um, an online course. And I think for some people, that's one of the things that makes them a little bit hesitant about getting into online learning is sort of that lack of of face to face community engagement, community connection. Um, and so those experiential opportunities that are associated with those either e or those web plus classes really add in that element. Um, and for each program, it's, it's really different what that element ends up being. For AIP, which is where I spend the majority of my life um, facilitating that course, the cohorts of our students, because they travel together. So if you're, if you're interested in the AIP, your cohort travels together for a good bit of your program. So you really form strong relationships with each other that helps with accountability, helps with motivation, um, helps grow your network. It's kind of these really wonderful connections that, that you know, go beyond the end of the degree program as well. And then in Earth Expeditions, you don't necessarily always see the same people when you're in those immersion experiences because you don't all always request the same Earth Expedition, um, but you really have these intense moments together um, with this group of people that forces you to sort of like almost like flash bond really quickly. Um, and so your, your network still grows in this incredible way, um, but has more of a global reach um, as opposed to that, that really specified local focus that, that the AIP students get in their kind of in-person um, times. And, and in Cleveland, each, each master institution is a part of the AIP. So each zoo and botanical garden puts specific spins on those experiential learning opportunities that highlight our strengths, the things that we're most proud of. So a student in Cleveland is going to spend a lot of time learning about primates, well not a lot of time, there's one class, but it's very in-depth and it's very good, uh, learning about primates because we're one of the leading zoos in primate research and primate welfare in the world. Um, so we have a lot of really wonderful connections to that, that world that we share with students. We also do a lot of action in our face-to-face -face days. So we don't just learn about how to advocate um, for a cause or how to practice environmental stewardship later, in our face-to-face -face days, we actually are practicing environmental stewardship. We're going out into nature and working on a restoration project. We're going out to uh, a dam that's going to be removed and we're helping to do some surveys of, of the plant life to see how that dam removal impacts the area. Um, so our students are actually and the same goes with the earth expeditions when we're with those community partners around the world, you're actively doing the things when you're together in person, which makes for a really strong and really, really personal um, learning experience. And Karen, I, I, I don't know if maybe I'm sort of been trying to keep a, a note of all of the questions that are popping up yeah, in the chat. Yeah. Um, and I, so I, I might have missed this when when I was taking a note, um, but there is there there was a question I think that was coming back to this little note that's on this slide that says one Earth Expeditions course can be counted towards the completion of the AIP degree, um, which is a really popular choice. So sometimes when students are torn on which degree program is best for me, um, I want to do them both. Those students often will end up going with AIP because that's the program that's designed intentionally to allow that option if the student wants it. Um, so to swap in that Earth Expedition course um, as a party, you'll have all those other Web Plus classes. And then for your other experiential hours, you're going to have this Earth Expedition. Because it's designed like that, it's a really easy approach to do kind of schedule wise. Um, and so there was a, a question um, from Anne-Marie about, does the EE align with AIP, with the AIP program from specific zoos? Um, so I think interpreting that question um, is maybe if you're in the AIP and you want to do an earth expedition, does the zoo kind of tell you which ones to go on um, so that they're the ones that are associated particularly with our conservation interests? And no, 
students can make those choices on their own. So you choose the ones, <laughs> thank you for confirming in Maria, I just see that. Um, so students make the choices of the ones that are most interesting to them um, and that relate to that master plan that Karen, Karen referred to. So whatever it is that that specific focus is for you, which one of these courses speaks to you, and then you, you'll you submit you know, your top however many choices and, and then they do some magic on the dragonfly end and you end up with something amazing and wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so you do not have to do, like Cleveland doesn't have to do only the courses that, that tie into a Cleveland conservation focus. But that was, that was a fantastic question. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for all that information, Katie. Yeah, some I uh, while we're talking questions, someone else has an excellent Stephanie has an excellent question. If you have an undergraduate degree in marketing, are there any prerequisites? Uh, uh, the, someone some other questions came in, so I'm not reading it exactly verbatim, but I followed that. That's a very common question. Yeah. There is one uh, requirement for one college or university level biology uh, with a C or better. Uh, but if you don't have that, we, we actually have a course here at Dragonfly that you can take. It's called Biology Through Inquiry. It's taught uh, in the summer, it's three credits. So you can take that to fulfill that uh, prerequisite at any time uh, of your time in the program. You don't have to take it before. Or of course, you're welcome to take any uh, biology course, um, you know, general biology course at a local institution, uh, if you wish to fulfill that requirement that way. That's a great question. But okay, so I see a bunch of other great questions are coming in. I think we need to move along because I'm probably, uh, we're telling too many stories or something <laughs> on here. Let's see, let me get the slide to advance if it will. It won't. Uh, Hmm. Karen, while you work on getting the slide to advance, I'm happy to answer some of the questions that are in here. Yeah. Uh, so there was a question pertaining to Earth Expeditions, wondering how long they are. So the actual in-person experience is nine or 10 days in the field. That doesn't include how long it takes you to get to that location. The summer semester still spans the entire summer. Um, and you do have coursework before and after the in-person piece, but it's just those 10, nine or 10 days in the field. And the second part of that question um, was about web-based classes. Are they live or comp completed at your own pace? Only those experiential learning classes, so either the Earth Expedition or the Web Plus class, have kind of live synchronous pieces, and that's largely the in-person pieces. Um, for the majority of everything else, the web core courses, the majority of the rest of the classes, the rest of the semester's work around those in those experiential courses is going to be asynchronous. So you can compete, you can complete it at your own pace. Um, when you first log into the workshop at the beginning of the semester, you see every assignment that's due the whole semester along with the due dates. So that you can plan a little better, uh, especially if you know that there are seasons of life that are particularly a little busier for you, you can maybe get a head start on doing some of that work um, in advance. So for the most part, if you're in person somewhere, that's synchronous, that's happening live time. The rest of the semester is asynchronous, minus occasionally there might be here or there a Zoom call um, or something that's that's available for a live time connection. Wonderful. Thank you, Katie. Uh, okay, I got the slide to advance. Um, okay, this next slide shows our 10 AIP locations, and you can see we're, we're spread out throughout the country. Um, and uh, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but you've got some of the top zoos and, and botanical gardens in the country, really, uh, some of the oldest ones and best known. Uh, so you may be located near one of those. And, and sometimes we get the question about if you're not, um, you know, people have come up with all kinds of creative ways. Sometimes people have family or friends uh, that live near a location and they stay with those folks. Uh, another option might be the GFP, um, as we mentioned, because then you have the international travel. People sometimes move and we've had people switch institutions or as Katie mentioned, uh, you know, we only have a couple institutions that teach a primatology class. And I had one student years ago who, who was really into primates, but she was at San Diego. So she actually traveled to Denver. Um, no, I'm sorry, she traveled to Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. All from Denver um, because they at Denver they didn't have a a primates class 
Uh, and here, here are just some uh, different images from our AIP classes. And you can see we really do get people out in the field. We've got our San Diego, one of our San Diego cohorts in the upper left there, looking like the, that could be a, perhaps a regional ecology. Many of our um, AIP sites teach regional ecology courses. They're almost like a mini EE where you have a experiential uh, trip where you might go out two, three or four days into some different ecosystems. In the opposite corner, you have someone who looks like they're doing some research perhaps with line behavior. Um, so we often get students uh, you know, behind the scenes in zoos to get to talk to some of the animal welfare folks and, and learn about um, all of the amazing conservation that's going on um, at zoos that often is unbeknownst to the public. Most of you, if you're familiar with zoos and botanical gardens, you know that um, they have suffered uh, kind of a, a PR image with, um, not to get into animal rights issues, but um, people who work in zoos frequently have to, to uh, talk about that. But um, a lot, they are so much more than places of entertainment now. They're really emerging as global leaders in conservation. And that's been kind of a shift from the early days of zoos in fact, one of our couple of our institutions joined together to teach an innovative course this year called the History of Zoos and Aquariums. That was very popular. Karen, while you're mentioning zoos, um, there were a couple of questions that were specifically about yes. zoos. Great. Um, Great. One being, there was a question. I'm sorry, I don't I don't remember who it was from, but I did jot down the question um, that was wondering if students that are enrolled in this program that are employed at a zoo, whether it's as a zookeeper, educator, um, you know, whatever whatever their role may be, do they typically stay and continue to work at the zoo? Um, and that's really up to each individual person. Um, in my experience with AIP program at Cleveland, um, they do. Uh, and largely it's because, you know, a lot of times zoo people, if you are a zoo person, you can maybe relate to this. Um, once you're in the zoo, you kind of like, you want to stay in zoo world. So maybe your role in zoo world changes, but you're kind of committed to staying in zoo world. Um, and so this definitely allows you to grow a larger network within zoo world, because there will always be a zoo person <laughs> pretty much in every single class that you have. Um, but it really depends on the person. If there's a person that wants to get out of zoo world and they're maybe in this to, you know, kind of develop um, something that makes them more marketable to working with a nonprofit or something like that, that might be the path that they're headed. And there are a lot of students that get into this program with the hope that it will make them more marketable for zoos, which is another question that someone had, um, particularly about working with animals. So this is um, potentially it could be zoo, but also the question was specifically about wildlife biologists. So if you get an MA um, degree from one of these programs, will it allow you, will it make you marketable to be working with animals? And on its own, the answer is no. Um, you're not gonna learn how to care for animals. You're not gonna um, be trained in, in the safety and in the proper welfare that we need to maintain for animals or even necessarily how that's, how that's devised. You'll have forays into that world to see and to learn about, about, about it, um, but you won't be trained in that. However, if you are a person that's getting that experience on your own elsewhere, so you're getting that hands-on connection with animals, you're volunteering at zoos, maybe you already work at a zoo in, in some capacity, maybe as a volunteer, you're kind of um, handling ambassador animals. This program can certainly help to grow your network and connect you with people that can connect you with those job openings. But on its own, it, it won't get you there, but it can definitely be an additional tool in your belt if you're collecting other tools to fill out that belt to make you marketable for those positions. Great, great. Thanks for answering that. Um, okay, well, getting back to the slides and yeah, continue to pepper uh, questions in there. That's all great. Um, here are our 15 or 16 different global sites. And so again, in the GFP, you have um, choice of, of where to go uh, for the most part. Let me do say we do have three courses, our Baja course, our Belize course in Brazil are specially designed for first year students. So we do um, have some curriculum in there to, to get you off on the right foot um, with the program. And, and after that, it's your, we do a pretty good job with placement, but as you can see all the different uh, Countries have a different theme. In Thailand, it's Buddhism and conservation. In the Galapagos, of course, with the history 
of evolution and, and Darwinism and tortoises, uh, you know, evolution is one of the main themes. In Amazon, it's avian and tropical ecology. Um, here are some slides, just real quick, from some of our different uh, EE courses. You know, so in, so in Kenya, you might have more of a safari experience. Uh, notice uh, water is a prominent feature in a couple of these slides. Um, there's several of our EEs that have snorkeling as part of the experience. And let me just say that our courses are designed for everyone and we're very conscious about accessibility. So if you're not, you know, you don't have to be a great swimmer. You don't have to have snorkeled. We have a, a typically a snorkeling 101 that happens and we have uh, life preservers that are available and, and we will, um, you know, deal with you if you're not specially comfortable in water. We have detailed questionnaires that we have students fill out before we, you know, take, you know, a group of you off to one of these international sites. But you can see we're literally out there learning in the field. And I can't emphasize enough how just amazing the, these courses are, um, you know, to, to get up early and watch the sunrise and be talking about conservation with 20 people from different places, you know, in potentially different countries even, who are all so passionate about conservation. Katie, where did you go out for your EEs? Um, as a student, I went yes. to Baja, uh, Kenya, and Thailand. And then as an instructor, I uh, led the Borneo EE for uh, four years. Wow. Great. Awesome. All okay. highly recommended. I recommend them all highly. There were some questions about EEs. Somebody was interested in, in housing information about earth expeditions. Yeah. And it's, it's really different for each course. Um, one of the great things is that on, um, so on the website, on Dragonfly's website, if you go to Earth Expeditions, it shares a lot of information about every individual course. You can get some of that information from just reading about each course. Um, and then also prior to any of the field seasons where students are going out into the field, there are webinars and online meetings where you can go and get lots of questions answered. Like, what exactly am I sleeping on? Or like, where how far is my bed going to be from the bathroom? Um, and that, that am I going to have a roof or not? So all, all of those questions are answered in depth in those calls, but you can get a lot of information from the Earth Expedition site. There was another EE related question too, or a GFP related question that said, do the GFP students ever meet in person at the, the local master's institution, zoo or botanical garden? As a part of the course, no, um, but they certainly can. And we try to grow our dragonfly network. So every master institution tries to kind of put out the feelers and the vibes to create, um, to, to be a part of the dragonfly community that's that's growing in each city. So you certainly can, uh, depending on which city you're in, you might have a, a large kind of um, come together of, of all current and alumni students in that area. Um, but for your class, you won't necessarily um, ever, ever meet at the zoo. Yeah, we, well, we're, we are really, uh, grow, you know, we have something like, I think it's 2,500 uh, graduates, something like that. It's over 2,000. And so you really become part of this amazing global network that, you know, some of these folks, you do develop lifelong relationships and friendships with them. It's really, really remarkable. Um, but we need to move on. I think we're, <laughs> we're taking too, too much of your time, but a lot of it, we're getting great questions. So we're mixing in some questions, but here's a slide on, well, that's the very common question we get is how will this degree benefit me? And, and uh, some of the different ways, uh, we've got a whole uh, webpage on, on this on our site, but content knowledge, you know, as we pointed out, we do attract a fair number of people who work in zoos or work in nature centers or natural history museums or the classroom. You know, um, some people love their current job and they may just are looking to advance to the next level. You know, for a lot of teachers, you need often there's incentive to get your master's or you're required to get certain numbers of CEUs per year. Um, you know, take your job to another level, get a promotion. Uh, publication submission is another one. We have one of our requirements of the degree, it is, is a kind of uh, threaded throughout some of the course, coursework is that you don't, you're not required to publish, but you are required to prepare a manuscript 
to publish, not necessarily just in a peer reviewed journal. We have some other options, practitioners guides. There's a wide range and, and this is actually available. You can, there's links to this on our website and you can see we've had something like 350 dragonflies publish articles and everything from uh, newspapers, op-ed uh, pieces to practitioners guides to uh, hardcore journals, science journals. Uh, leadership and voice. We, um, again, one of our core tenets is, is voice and promoting people's voice and respecting everyone's voice. Uh, but we also have two so-called leadership challenges that, that we uh, have you perform. And this, uh, Katie, what, can you give us some examples of uh, some of the types of leadership challenges that your students have done there's the, the publication challenge, but what about the community leadership challenge? Yeah, the community leadership challenge is ultimately about pushing yourself kind of outside of your, your already comfort zone um, in terms of your leadership role in your chosen field and in your chosen community. So for some, some students that ends up being uh, presenting at a conference where they've never presented before, whereas if presenting at a conference is something you do regularly, that would not count as your community leadership challenge. Um, but for a lot, but maybe presenting at a new conference you've never presented at, that could count. We have students that join uh, zoning commissions in their communities or serve on boards for nonprofits. Um, we've had some students that will create a bio blitz of sorts, or they'll kind of like almost create their own project and their own community engagement um, initiative out in, again, in their community of choice. So it really depends on, on what that student is doing. When I was a graduate student, my community leadership challenge was um, creating one of the courses as we were building our AIP kind of suite of classes, um, I created a collaboratively built um, environmental stewardship course where I reached out to organizations that are in the greater Cleveland area and got input um, and we kind of collaboratively built this course and then created it. It was five field trips, um, so it wasn't just at the zoo, it was kind of all over the Cleveland area um, that put me in a role interacting with, with professional colleagues that I I didn't normally interact with. So it really has to do with you and what your interests are in terms of how you want that to, to kind of flesh out and, and take shape. Great, thanks. Uh, program costs, let's talk a little bit about this since this is a question we commonly get. And what we've done here is we've kind of broken down uh, the first year costs for both the um, AIP and the GFP. Um, start with, starting with AIP, um, the first summer you take a course called Foundations of Inquiry, that's three credits. Uh, and then, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got a uh, chat here is in the way, so I'm having a hard time kind of seeing this, this slide. Can you read the middle two uh, squares? Sorry about that, technical issues here. The fall and spring squares. Yeah, that yeah, was, that yeah. Um, yeah, in fall, it's conservation science and community, which is three credits, and then AIP Web Plus class, which is also um, uh, three credits. Uh, and so it, that depends, whatever that AIP Web Plus course, it kind of depends on the institution. Um, each, each institution has their own, again, like Karen said, um, courses that they offer, and then also the order in which they're offered for students. Um, in spring, there's biology and age of technology. That's your web core course, which is three credits, um, plus an AIP web plus course that maybe is one credit, maybe it's three credits. Again, it depends on the institution. It depends on the classes, the web plus classes that you're deciding to take. Um, but for the sake of this uh, cost model, it's factoring it in at, at one credit. Um, and then that brings um, the year total to being a little over $6,000 because it's six core credits at 395 per credit hour. And it is, or 395 per credit hour? Yeah. And then seven web plus credits um, at 520 per credit hour. Um, and so that equals a little bit over $6,000 for that, that first year. And there is a, um, a freeze um, cycle on cost that Miami only increases their costs every three years. So depending on what, I think there's one more year on this particular yeah. tuition set. And then after this year's over, there are increases, but the increases are always very modest for this program. Dragonfly works really hard um, with the university to keep those increases really low. Um, but then after it increases, you know that it's not gonna increase again for another three years. So it is really nice for that planning piece of things. 
Yeah, that's correct, Katie. And in summer of 2024, we're projected to have an, an increase. And so the projected is about like 10% increase. But I should point, we operate under a model called market driven tuition. So if you, so the cost per credit hour for, for our courses is only roughly a third of what, if you look across all majors at Miami University. And, and a lot of that is because uh, you know, people working in conservation don't, you know, often those types of positions are not really lucrative. Sometimes you're working for nonprofits and you're not making a lot of money. Um, here's a similar model for the GFP, and I'm not going to go over this in detail because it's quite similar, but let me do point out that that the, the added cost, some of the added cost uh, is going to do with the uh, have to do with the program fees that are associated with the GFP because you're going to be spending roughly uh, 10 days in country and, and uh, all of your room and board is covered during that time and, and we talked about so you're not paying for meals you're not paying for lodging that's covered in the program fees and then you would have an additional fee for airfare. So if uh, you know if you're really if you're close to an AIP institution and money is a big concern, that might argue for applying to the AIP um, and then doing one EE. Perhaps I think over half of our AIP students are electing to do EEs now. It's quite a high percentage. Um, you don't have to, but but so the GFP is a little bit more expensive. Uh, some other ways that people fund their education, um, uh, I would definitely look into workplace um, tuition reimbursement programs. You, you may have one and, and not be aware of it. You know, talk to your supervisor, talk to HR, those types of folks, they can let you know about that. Uh, consider federal financial aid. Let me point out as a graduate student, uh, because we're a part-time program, you just have to carry five credit hours or more per semester, and you will qualify for federal financial aid. And what you can do sometimes is budget, and, and you won't, most students, you know, you may not always or even every, you know, often reach that five credit um, hour Cut off. It just depends on how quickly you're going to complete the program. But but if that's an incentive, you can budget and typically spread out some of those dollars over a couple of semesters. And then things like the GI Bill, AmeriCorps has a nice um, education kind of uh, 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 gift associated with that. Gift isn't the right word, but and then there are our various um, grants and scholarships. We have a page just devoted to some of the different scholarships that we have available. And then you can do the old fashioned pay as you go. Um, for some folks that that's an that's how they fund their education. Katie, if you don't mind me asking, do you remember what strategy you used when you were a graduate student? Yeah, mine was a mix of um, workplace tuition reimbursement, especially since they were asking me to do it as a part of my job. Um, right. And then and then me paying as I go. So I, I don't think I would have been able to pay as I go, maybe if it weren't for that additional workplace reimbursement, but it was a partial reimbursement for all of my classes. So it made what I had to put up um, more manageable for me. Awesome, great. And then I'll, I'll move to another slide, but I'm seeing a question from a Christopher is wanting to know why the program is called uh, Advanced Inquiry for the AIP. Are you asking me that? Oh, question? yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you oh, I was gonna say I didn't I didn't even see that question. Yeah. I missed that oh, one. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, why is it called the advanced inquiry program? program? Um, well, uh <laughs> so, so. That's a good question. This is essentially how I answer every question in the Advanced Inquiry Program. Um, so the Advanced Inquiry Program um, is called the Advanced Inquiry Program because uh, it's it's inquiry based first and foremost, um, right? So it's about it's about asking questions and and figuring out ways to answer your own questions, not just waiting for somebody to give you answers, which is what science is all about, right? You create your question, you figure out a way to collect data, answer your own question. In more in reality, you're also then ending up with five more questions that you want to pursue. Um, 
And then really that advanced inquiry program piece is that there are, by this point, we're now in graduate school, so we're, we're kind of up in the level of the inquiry that you're doing. We're asking tougher questions. And even as you move through the program, you're asking tougher questions, more complex questions. You're challenging yourself. You're challenging the field to explore what the answers to these might look like and the ways in which you might gather data to answer those questions. So it's really um, kind of taking that, that study design concept and, and being more advanced in it in this, in this graduate program. Karen, I did see a couple of questions um, in here that were about, that I, I think are maybe important to talk about. Yeah. Um, there were some questions about what is the difference between an MA and an MS in terms of what's going to make you marketable for certain certain jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think that you're and there was also a biology versus zoology. So the MA is in biology. Um, back in the day, it was housed in the zoology program, but. Um, the way that Miami has sort of restructured their academic schools kind of within their university, that the biology department is the biology department. It's no longer called like zoology and botany and, and all the different things. It's the collective biology department. And so your MA will be from, will be in biology in this degree. The difference between an MA and an MS, I don't think that we're often really used to seeing an MA in biology, but that's really intentional for us because even though this is a biologically focused program, it's also just as much a human focused program, a community engagement focused program. So the A in this um, kind of, it's, it's the representative of that human focus, right? We're engaging others. We're not operating in a bubble. We're not operating in a lab alone with a microscope, which is an awesome way to learn if that's, if that's how you wanna learn. And so for some of these jobs that maybe if you're interested in doing you know, in-depth lab or field research um, where you're designing these multi-year studies, where you're following wolves around the Arctic and collecting data, um, it's not to say that you can't make that happen with this degree program and with an MA, um, but I think it's important for you to, for students to think about where, where do you want to be? Where, where do you want to go? And especially after an information session like this, then asking yourself, does this sound like a program that's gonna help to step me in the direction of where I wanna be? Or maybe it is that MS is, is a better fit. So a lot of times if you're interested in that kind of more, um, I don't wanna say like, closed off, because certainly no, no successful conservation program is closed off by any means. Um, but if you're less interested kind of in that, that community engagement, that sort of like community voice aspect, and you're more interested in sort of like really in-depth research about a particular species or, or something like that, then that is a really legitimate question to ask yourself. Is the MS maybe a better fit for, for what you want to do? And and the Dragonfly staff or the staff at your local master institution is happy to help you kind of sort through those thoughts once you have them to figure out if this seems like it might be a good a good step in getting you where you want to be. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. You know, so you're not going to uh, we're in a sense almost like an interdisciplinary degree because, you know, we're really focusing on communicating science to, in many cases, the students are focusing on the, the area between the hard science and communicating that to the public, which, which takes a lot of creativity and it takes a lot of art. And we do, certainly we do have some of our students go on to PhDs, but most of them are probably less, you know, as Katie kind of implied, hard traditional science, um, you know, publishing in, in peer reviewed journal articles and maybe, you know, going on in um, the human dimensions of, of wildlife or, or something that is kind of more interdisciplinary. But that that is a valid question, as Katie pointed out, an important question uh, to ask. Uh, all right, we are coming almost to an hour here, but we've been answering a lot of questions here. So let's talk about some application tips. Um, start early would be one thing. We do have uh, our deadlines, you know, are still a ways away. We've got January 28th is the deadline for the GFP. And then February 28th is the deadline for the AIP. Um, it's gonna, however, if you've been out of school a while, it may take some time to get your transcripts, um, depending on, you know, uh, every institution has different mechanisms for doing that. And then your recommendation letters, you certainly want to give your writers, we asked for two to three recommendation letters. Um, and you certainly want to give those folks plenty of time. Uh, references, think professional. 
um, you know, someone who is able to speak to your abilities and your motivation for graduate school and, you know, the, and that you've talked to really about Project Dragonfly in the best case so that they know, you know, what the program is you're applying for can, and can speak to those qualities. Um, not friends or, or family members. We certainly get those once in a while. If you've been, you know, if you haven't worked, you know, at a traditional job for a while, so you've been a, a caretaker, uh, a primary caregiver, or or raising the kids at home, um, you know, don't be afraid to put that in your letter. Uh, that's fine. Just uh, we we work with everyone. We're not going to exclude you based on lack of a a, a you know nine to five job. Um, we, let's see, remind your, the essays, uh, read about the, uh, program. And again, you're going to write two essays. They're pretty short, but still, obviously you want to check them for grammar and spell checking and all that, but we're reading importantly for content. We want to see that you've done your research about the program and, and ki kind of as Katie spoke to, and I spoke to, you know, we, we want you to be convinced that you're a good match for the program and that you've also considered what the degree can do for you. Um, don't be afraid to highlight hobbies if you've done any kind of volunteering or even if you just like to, you know, go bird watching on Saturdays or in your free time or, you know, you're really into gardening or, or whatever. Um, and those things are, you know, part of who you are and why you're interested in the natural world and give you joy. Don't be afraid to share those. Let us see your personality. Um, but then obviously, definitely, as I said, proofread and revise and let someone else read them. Any other tips that you could think of from your perspective, Katie? I think those are great. Um, I, I was answering a couple questions in the chat, so maybe you mentioned this, but one of the things I think is really nice is that when you submit your transcripts during your application, you can do the unofficial ones, so you don't have to wait for those official ones to come through, which I think was always a big kind of stressor for students because you can't control that you're just at the mercy of your your previous awarding institutions um so that's really nice and then after you're accepted to the program you have a certain window of opportunity to get those official ones in so um yeah. no but i think the rest of that sounds sounds great be confident in who you are and why you want to be a part of the program and and let that come through in your essay responses and and hopefully the the people you ask to be your references um will will help that to shine through too yeah yeah absolutely um, if we have time here, um, you know, we, we may pull up. It's, a, it's really a very, very quick application. Uh, we may not have time because we've kind of gone on long here, but, um, uh, you know, you, there are no entrance exams. So we basically, we ask for a resume. So you upload a resume um, and then unofficial transcripts uh, and then the two essays and uh, your program fee. It's very, uh, you know, rather quick streamlined if you're used to filling out, um, you know, graduate school forms that take days and days. But, um, you know, for AIP applicants, uh, you know, you select which AIP sites and more and more we're having more and more people actually apply to both degrees. They're, they're really not sure and they, uh, you know, want us to consider them for the GFP and the AIP or multiple sites. Um, one important thing, the undergraduate GPA is another thing. The graduate school does put a constraint on us of having a minimum, you know, on a four point scale, a minimum GPA of 2.75. Um, if you're under that and you've been, particularly if you've been out of school for five years or more and you have significant, um, you know, post-grad life experience, you know, for a strong applicant, we can petition that. So even that is not a barrier if you're not too much below that. Um, so we really, um, you know, try to work with you wherever you are, uh, if you're really motivated to get in. And Aaron, then, do you know the average acceptance rate? That was a question that was asked, and I'm uh, not sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I get that too, and I, I you know, since I basically, um, you know. At the end of the day, I'm looking at all AIP applicants. I would say, you know, it's pretty high, but uh, um, you know, I don't have any like statistics at my fingertips. We 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 do turn away folks, but it's not um, because we 
have so many, you know, we usually can fit people in somewhere if, if you know, if they're sincerely motivated. We even have, if you're below that 2.75 GPA, sometimes we um, say you, you can do something called CGE, which is continuing graduate student, which I know several students who've gotten into the program that way. What they do is they take a standalone course and kind of prove themselves and that shows us a, a co course or two and then they reapply. And so that also, uh, but um, so we're, we're not turning away SCADs and SCADs because one reason is we've got so many seats. Now I, having, uh, uh, you know, been involved with the AIP program more than some of our locations are very competitive. I would say that San Diego and um, Cincinnati are two of our most competitive um, institutions. They have good you know, good reputations and get, particularly San Diego gets a lot of applications. They get more. And so we go through alternates. So it really, if you've got some flexibility though, we can usually squeeze you in somewhere. Not that we don't turn. That's kind of, that isn't a concrete answer, but um, we don't really keep statistics on that. We've got a pretty high acceptance rate because we get pretty good people to be honest, you know, well, you can, I'm sure you can tell us, Katie, the, the average Dragonfly student is just really interesting, um, you know, engaged folks from all different backgrounds. That's one thing that makes it so phenomenal for me to, on this side of the program to work with the students. They're all uh, got such diverse uh, backgrounds and bring such different things to all the courses. It's just wonderful. So. Okay, well, we've kept, um, you know, it's it's over an hour now. So if you have to drop off the call, I, I see we've uh, dropped off a few, but um, Katie and I would certainly be happy to hang around here for another 10 or minutes or 15 minutes and answer questions. We're so glad you all have uh, made it. Oh, let us, um, one thing I wanna do for sure is put our emails in the chat. Katie, I'll, let me, I'll put mine on, whoops. If you've got any questions and we run out of time, um, there are our emails. Um, and actually let me advance one more slide because we've got a couple more. There are some emails there too. Those are just our kind of stock Dragonfly emails, but those will actually go to a real person and you'll get your um, question eventually answered. Um, and what else, Katie? What are, what are some questions that we didn't get to? Do you have anything jotted down there? Yeah, okay. um, so I've, I've been typing responses to some of the questions that, that were a little bit easier to get to via a text Great. response. Um, so some of those have already been answered. Uh, the one I was just about to start writing was a question that was asked earlier, um, about a half hour ago, um, and it was about the asynchronous courses and wondering if there was still an opportunity to ask questions, even though there's not a live time kind of dialogue that's happening. And the answer to that is a thousand percent yes. Um, so the courses, even though they're not happening in live time, they're all run by live people that are live time looking at all, well, in whatever version of live time that are in real life, I guess, not live time, that are in real life, reading your responses, reading your questions. So when you're in the workshops, you're writing down, not only you're submitting your assignments, your answers to discussion prompts or your drafts or the papers that you're writing, but you're also, you can submit questions, you can email questions, but we largely even keep all those questions in the workshop because chances are, if you have a question, one of the other students in the class does too. Um, so there's lots of back and forth. Um, sometimes you don't get an immediate rant, immediate reaction or immediate answer because it's not live time, but you usually get a response within 24 hours from your instructor, especially if they know you have a project coming up and you have questions about that, or in the earth expeditions, you have questions about pre-travel. Um, so those, those feedback um, situations still definitely happen. It's just a little bit longer because somebody has, you have to wait for, for them to read it, but there are live people in there making, making things happen and answering your questions. Someone just wanted to know if they will have access to this recording. Yeah, we will share uh, the recording of this webinar and there are others from previous webinars because we get different questions. I'm seeing people saying, thank you so much. It's wonderful to have so many wonderful folks on the call, um, but we again, will continue to stay on and uh, 
People are saying thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We hope to see you, we see your application come through and see you in one of our workshops. Very exciting. So thank you, Jason from, yep, thank, thank, every, thank you for so many interesting, so many great questions, as Katie said. Yes, thank you all. And I think we were able to go through um, and see, oh, there's a question right there. Is there an application fee? There is an application fee. Um, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, when I applied, I think it was like $30, but that was a really long time ago. $50, don't quote 50? me. Okay. I, think. Okay. I think it's $50. Yeah, there is an application fee. And I did scroll back through and I think that we got all the questions either in a verbal or written good. response. So I think, I think we're good. This session is for any time next year. Uh, like for, so I think um, Francis, if you're asking, is this the application time for next year? So students that are submitting their application oh, now- Oh, wants to know if you can start summer or fall. That's a great question. Oh, okay. We, had, we the last couple of years with COVID, we've added uh, some fall, we've added a fall uh, start too. And I'm not 100% sure that you, you've accepted fall applicants for what, the last two or three years, Katie? Yeah, the last three years, it's been a pretty popular option with the Cleveland yeah. crew. Yeah. Yeah, I think... As far as I know, we're going to continue that. Does every place offer? No, they don't. That's a good question. Some of some of our MIs um, just don't want to deal. Well, you. Well, it's kind of a long answer, but they're um, no, not every place. The GFP, and then I would say half of our AIP locations have offered a false start. Yeah, I think it might even be fewer. I think it's only three, three, three or four of the MIs. Yeah, have continued to do it. Um, more have 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 done it in the past, but it's ultimately up to you know um, what seems to work best with that MI scope and sequence, um, yeah. and also how how busy their cohorts are. So, like yeah, you mentioned, there, Cincinnati and San Diego are pretty staff. slammed. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but a lot of students. You know, um, you know, you can apply and then defer your uh, your seat until the following year. That's uh, Anne Murray, if you're still on. That's an uh, option that a fair number of students do. Yep, you're here, great. Mm -hmm. Just keep firing the questions away. Thank you, thank everyone for Thank you all for showing up.